Uh, so how's everybody doing out there towards the end of the meeting here? Great? <laughs> Woo! Great meeting, right? Fantastic. OK, uh, as Colin suggested, I'm going to talk to you for a few minutes here uh, from a perspective of a user, if you will, of all this talk about big data, all of these systems, everything that you all have been talking about the last couple days. Uh, unfortunately, I was only here today, but I heard yesterday was fabulous, too. Um, so I am going to tell you in a minute uh, about this experimental man project and some of the data I've collected on myself. Uh, but I want to start with uh, putting this in a context of essentially what I've learned. And to start with that, since this is an enormous amount of data that's been collected, um, I'm sure that people have gone over just how much data is out there, but I think it bears repeating that we're talking about mountains of data here, Annapurna mountain ranges of data, you know, Mount Everest of data. And when you're sitting there like me with your you know, personal data over 1,000 gigabytes, uh, you, you know, you're having a personal perspective on this. And one lesson I have learned in all of my experimentation over the last 10 years is that creating data is easy. In fact, we do it incredibly well in our civilization, especially out here in the civilization around Silicon Valley. In fact, this is our Parthenon, our pyramids at the moment. We are really good at this. We are not as good, at least at the moment, although I think we're getting better, at making sense of it, especially for somebody like me. I am not a scientist. I am not an engineer. I'm not a physician. I'm the guy that needs to actually understand this so that I can be as healthy as I possibly can be. So just to give you a little perspective, and I'm going to start talk, I'm going to um, circle back to my own data and how much there is. Uh, according to an IBM study, um, all the data in the world per day being created, actually this is last year, but 2.5 exabytes of data a day. And to put that in perspective, in the last two years, we produced 90% of all data created by humanity since the beginning. So amazing amounts of data being created as we speak. In fact, in the time I've been speaking here, we've been creating extraordinary amounts of data in the world. Uh, last year, the total data was 1.8 zettabytes. That's septillions of data. And I just put it up here with all the zeros. In, in, by 2020, according to IBM, this is going to be 50 times this amount of data. And by the way, that 1.8 zettabytes doesn't even include all that much medical data yet, because as we know, a lot of this has not been digitized. So just one little example uh, of what this means when you really put it in the context of real people. Seven billion genomes are, are alive right now, over seven billion genomes. And if we actually sequence all of them, which I go to a lot of meetings where people talk about, you know, let's sequence everybody, you know, complete genomes, all of that data, that would be hundreds of zettabytes of data just for that amount of information about genetic information. Forget all the rest of it. You can tell that's far more than you know, is produced right now total in the entire planet. So I just wanted to can put that in perspective about how uh, one individual, when you multiply it by everyone on Earth, can produce a heck of a lot of data. And just some of the other data that's going to be produced uh, from drugs, from scanning technologies, nanotech, um, uh, cell and, and synthetic biology technologies. Uh, this is kind of an interesting one. I've actually uh, tried out this exoskeleton, uh, various data being created for that, uh, biosensors, uh, all the different devices we're using, uh, all the apps. And as a journalist, I am constantly, every day, get dozens of pitches about apps for everything. And one day we'll figure out what this all means, but it is producing a heck of a lot of data. Um, but really what I want to talk to you about is how this uh, affects you and me and our families. This is my family, my two parents in the early 80s. Uh, my son, who is actually even taller now at 17 than he was in this picture taken just a few months ago, uh, and my niece. Uh, these are the people that are important to us. And this is what this is really all about. And it's what we call personalized health which is keeping people healthy as opposed to personalized medicine, which is uh, treating them once they're sick. So the Experimental Man Project, this, I didn't really set out to do a massive study on data collection, but that ended up being what it was about. And by the way, this project was done primarily as a journalist and a sto storyteller. It started with an assignment I got from Wired Magazine 
uh, back in 2001, over 10 years ago, to write about something called the personal, or the, the Human Genome Project, which you know I knew something about. But you know, how do you humanize this story? And this was off and running, and done all this other crazy testing. So thousands of tests, hundreds of labs, uh, as, uh, as Colin suggested, all over the world. Uh, I'm up to over 25,000 genotypes annotated. Uh, these are various traits. Uh, I will give you a little hint that this has not changed my life, at least not yet. Uh, much of this is still so preliminary that it's not really much use to an individual. Um, 1,500 environmental toxin levels. This is actually measuring the levels of all of these toxins, PCBs, pesticides, et cetera, in my body. Uh, that was a National Geographic story, uh, most of it back in 2006. Um, hours and hours on various scanners, especially MRI scanners. I try to avoid doing harm to myself, so I did do a CT scan for the project, but that was it with radiation. Uh, proteome, microbiome, you name it, it's been done. So what have I learned? Uh, just give you a, a little sampler here of all of this data. Um, and some of this is useful, some of it's not. I learned that I have a slightly increased risk for heart attack. And for those of you that know about statistical studies around genetics, that's almost insignificant. And in fact, uh, that, that's a particularly prominent marker uh, associated with heart attack risk. Uh, but I have 354 markers that I can identify about myself around heart attack. Uh, I have increased risk, lower risk, no risk. It's all over the map. So clearly, a lot of work still needs to be done on this. Warfarin sensitivity, I'm a, a highly sensitive to taking blood thinner, Coumadin. And so this is an important one because this actually has clinical validation. If I was ever going to tattoo any of this data on my body in case I was unconscious and needed to have this drug warfarin, this would be it. Because if you gave me the normal dose, uh, you could do me great harm or possibly kill me. Uh, obviously, there are lots of genes around behavior. Uh, I came out not being very empathetic in one of them. But I don't really care what you think. <laughs> uh, DDT, we're now getting into environmental levels. Uh, this is not probabilities anymore. This is actual levels inside of me compared to national means. So I have 50% higher levels of DDT, which probably goes back to when I was a kid. And they used to spray DDT to get rid of the mosquitoes in my, where I lived out in Kansas. And we were told to stay inside as, as little boys, but of course we didn't. We went and got our bikes, and we rode around as they were spraying it and in and out of the cloud of DDT. And so all these years later, with DDT having a half-life in the human body of about 25 years, I still have pretty high levels. Uh, mercury is an interesting one. I, it, mercury goes in and out of your body very quickly, uh, dissipates quickly, uh, at least in your blood. And we primarily get it from eating large fish. So I did a before and after mercury test. I had my test done. I then went and had two meals of fish, a swordfish and a, and a halibut, one for lunch, one for dinner. And afterward, the next day, I was tested. And my levels went from four parts per billion to 13 parts per billion. Four is below the safety threshold, according to the EPA. 13 is above it. And, and this is an interesting one, because I didn't stop there. I actually uh, checked my genetics to see if I had sensitivity to mercury. And it turns out I have seven times risk for different neurobehavioral deficits. So if you see me eating a large fish, I'm not going to really care what you think, but my brain is going to be all over the place. And this may be, it's especially susceptible for, for men or, or males. So women, maybe that's one of the reasons why a guy's a little loopy after a meal of swordfish. Um, MRI scans on my brain, uh, Alzheimer's, I had no trace, thankfully, uh, as our last speaker suggested. Uh, there's, there, you are able to see now in MRI scans uh, well before you show symptoms uh, that this might be in your future. Fortunately, I came up with no trace. Uh, I had all kinds of behavioral and you know, stimulus tests done in MRI scans, uh, everything from greed and altruism to gambling, addiction, or whatever. Uh, but since it's a political season, I thought I would uh, mention that I was tested to see if I was a Republican or a Democrat at the National Institutes of Health. It's a work being done on belief systems. And you can walk into this lab at the NIH, taxpayers' money. Um, you can put down on a piece of paper you're a Republican or a Democrat. They'll put it in an envelope, seal it without looking at it, put you in the scanner, 
You're looking at images of various politicians, like you might put Barack Obama, honest, no, liar, you know, they're putting words up, and your brain outs you. Almost no one comes out to be independent, by the way. And think about that. I'm not, I'm not talking about ethics in this talk, but think about here. Um, you know, if somebody was tested, say, uh, are they really a friend of O'Reilly? We could, we could test them with their brains. Okay, my favorite genetic marker, if I had a cup of coffee, I'd sip it right now, the caffeine fast metabolizer gene, um, which is, basically allows me to drink coffee whenever I want without worrying about it. Finally, though, what does all this mean? And I'm ripping through this, by the way, and uh, I'll give you a website here in a second, and you can get a lot more information. But in the end, I wanted to try to tie together all this disparate information. And so we came up um, with a heart attack risk put through an algorithm, a uh, biostimulation company called Intellos. And I got three different options, actually, or three different possible futures. And this, in a way, is what this is all about. Um, I, the yellow line there is a 20 or 70% risk factor for heart attack um, if, if, if I do one thing, which is gain weight. Um, the little green line down there is if I gain no weight. So interestingly enough, this gives me different futures depending on my behavior. And this is really what we want to do with all this information. So uh, I continue to get testing. This is actually an induced pluripotent stem cell line that was created by a lab up in Wisconsin. Um, we, out of that, have run experiments on heart cells that were generated from the IPS line. Uh, we're now uh, creating neurons, uh, seeing if there's some use for these cells, which essentially are genetically identical to me, for determining uh, the health of my cells. Uh, you might be able to test uh, the reaction of cells, like heart cells, for uh, different drugs. And so this is a new round of testing in the Experimental MAN project. So what does this mean for data, though? So I have produced over 1,000 gigabytes of data with all of this experimentation. And this is just for me right now but it could be for you in the future. In fact, this is really what we want in some ways, all of this information to be collected. Now, if everyone on the planet had this done, you would be in yottabytes of data. I don't know how many of you have even heard of yottabytes. This is a really big number. And in fact, I, of course, had to put yotta, although you spell it differently, uh, because I think the force needs to be with us to actually deal with all of this data. Um, also, to give you some context of even more information that can be collected. Um, I borrowed this slide from my friend Eric Shad, who's going to be speaking to you in just a moment, about all of the aspects of human biology that, that can be tested and data collected. It's an enormous amount of stuff. So as I said, um, you can grab uh, some more information here uh, from the Experimental Man website, experimentalman.com. And I'd love for you all to do that. And this is the book. Uh, experimental man. And by the way, um, I just recently uh, wrote another book uh, that came out. It was an e-book, a very short book, so it's easy to read, called When I'm 164. And we were hearing about aging a minute ago. The subtitle to this is The Science of Radical Life Extension and What Happens If It Succeeds. And in fact, if we end up radically extending lifespan or even continuing to increase lifespan at the current rate, uh, we're going to just be producing that much more data. So anyway, thank you all very much.